Good morning, my name is Chris Fox, and today we're talking about how to make character names that don't suck. If you need a video on more general names, that does exist, it's the first one in this series, but if you want to be naming your characters, you are in the right place. So how do we do this? How do we make names that are both unique but understandable, that evoke kind of the right kind of feel, that, that really fit our genre? I mean, it's a tall order. So I'm going to start more with last names and, and where names come from in general, because understanding this will, will help you concoct your own names in a believable way. And then we're going to discuss how language evolves over time because words change. You know, consonants tend to soften for the most part, and this process changes a language over time. And so if you start with a word that fits one of the conventions you're about to learn, and then you slightly modify it, you'll find that you're able to make unique names that are, are very similar to a name that makes a lot of sense. And, and the reader will pick up on that, even if it's not consciously. So anyway, I, I, I know that uh, from the description that may not tell you exactly how this process works. Let's just jump into it. Okay, so names come from one of four primary sources. And this is global. If you look at any culture in the world, the names that you're getting from that culture is probably going to stem from one of these four categories. The first one is patronymic, meaning that you are getting your name in some way inherited from your father or really from your mother, despite the, the patrimony name. It's going to come from one of those sources. You're getting an ancestor's name passed down to you. So good examples of that would be Michael Caine. His last name, Cain, it's clearly a biblical name, and theoretically, Michael descends all the way back to biblical Cain at some point in the distant past. And that's inherited and has been kept by his family line ever since. And so you're going to hear names like that. There are also more generic ones, but it's easier to spot kind of how the name was created, like Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson, well, theoretically, he had somebody in his family in the distant past named Jeff or Jeffer, and Jeffer's son created the name Jefferson. And that's, you know, obviously what Thomas Jefferson inherited later on in his life. So those are patronymic names, and they are coming from their, their sire, their, their parent. The next category is, let me look at my list here, locative. So locative is, is based really on the location of the person who took the name. Most people, the further back in time that you go, traveled very little. Most people would not leave more than, say, 20 miles around their house unless you were some sort of royal person or you had a job like a courier that required you to ride or travel long distances. And so you'd be named based on local landmarks or a location if you happen to be near a big city. So a good example of a locative name would be somebody like Sam Houston. You know, his last name is Houston because odds are good. When that name was, was given, there was probably only one of each given person with, with a name in a town, maybe only a couple hundred people. And so it was Sam from Houston or in Spanish, you know, Sam de Houston. You hear that a lot. And that, of course, over time is shortened to Sam Houston. We're getting, you know, that, that appellation where it's a kind of appending the location to his name. And then, you know, even though his ancestors may leave Houston, they are keeping that name and sort of carrying it down their lineage. But that's how the name originally was created. Other, other names that are based on location would be like Dakota Fanning. So her last name Fanning is actually a bastardization of an Irish word, Fenn which is kind of a marshy swamp area. Now, there are lots of lowlands in both Scotland and in Ireland that are, are filled with fens, with you know, these marshes. And so if you were a person that lived in that area, you would be of the fens, or you'd be a fanning. You were a person that was from that area. And that's how that name was, was created. So even though, again, the, the ancestors have long since left where this name was given to their family, and they probably don't live near you know, marshy swamps anymore, that's where the name originated. And we see this globally. Again, you're, you're being named for a landmark. If you live near a hilltop, then your last name might be Hilltop. You know, that, that's very, very common. The next type of naming convention is based on kind of your socioeconomic status, your, your job title, if you will. If you were a blacksmith, then, you know, your last name might be Smith. I mean, and if you think Will Smith, I mean, you, you, you know, there's a reason why Smith is one of the most common names in the world. It was a very common profession then, and of course, other people, nobody needed to prove that they were a smith to adopt this name, and so it became very common because it was a prestigious name, and so lots of people were taking it because of the prestigious career that originally had birthed it. Other people with a, a status-based name, I've got my long list in front of me here, Patrick Stewart, you know, one of my favorite actors of all time, Captain Picard, his last name Stewart. Stewart is a bastardization of Stewart, and 
if you look back into the the Middle Ages and even into the Renaissance, stewards were very, very common. Basically, this was like your event coordinator who ran an entire castle or, you know, looked after an entire manor house. And these people were caretakers for their families. And they, it was oftentimes an inherited position. And so steward or Stuart could become that last name based on that person's status. And finally, the fourth different category of names is nicknames. And you can kind of see how these arose. So if you were in town and, and let's say, you know, you were known for exhibiting traits of an animal, like let's say you were very fox-like, <laughs> you know, my last name being fox, either you looked like a fox or more likely, you know, you behaved in the manner associated with a fox. And so people started calling you fox. And of course, that name is cool. So his family decided, you know, probably to keep that name. And that's how the first foxes were born. And then, you know, same is, is true of, let's say, Kira Knightley. I love that last name, Knightley, if you unpack it and think about it. Now, odds are good, her last name is not named after an actual knight. Because if it was an actual knight, they would have taken that knight's name, which, you know, would, would have been legal because he was knighted. You know, he was made a noble and therefore, you know, you're creating that name. But if somebody either was a bastard child of that house or maybe they were just known locally for being very kind of upstanding or, or even, you know, it just kind of, you know, putting on airs and acting like they were knights when they weren't knights, you know, maybe somebody nicknamed them knightly and they decided to to take that name. So nicknames are very, very common. And, and, you know, you can't really prove the etymology of a word like that, but you can see how maybe it would have come into existence. I mean, you can certainly imagine a situation where you might call a local family, you know, knightly. So it's the knightlies or acting like the knightlies again. So those are the four basic categories. And in the next section of the video, we're going to jump into a little bit more how you can apply them to creating your own name. Okay, so I have blown this up to be about 300% size, so hopefully this is visible. But, but how do you put the principles that we learned in the last section to use? Like, if you know that these names come from one of four categories, like, how do we build them and sort of create names in the way that they were created back then? And what I'm, I'm seeing, just looking at a lot of different names at a lot of different places, is the simplest way is to start with an adjective, and that can be size, that can be color, and then you're going to add to that a relevant noun, which usually describes that character's temperament or appearance. So, you know, you could do little beard or long fellow or tall fellow or black skin or red skin or green skin or, you know, long hair or short hair. All of these are possible names that could come out of this. You could also mix in your character's social status, like what is the job that they are doing? So it could be long knight or tall knight or dark smith or, you know, whichever of those that you think is relevant to you. And then, of course, you can finally work in the, the region that they're from. And that can give you names like Littlefellow or Blackbeard or White Hills, you know, if you're working with those regions as well. So you can come up with a whole bunch of different names very easily by looking at the landmarks and the, the kind of customs of the area where you are making the names. They're going to use names that are relevant to their everyday life. If, if this you know, story is taking place in an epic fantasy world and, and they've got sort of a medieval technology scale, you're, you're not going to see any of the more modern names or concepts that we're used to. And so names that are based on those will vanish. You're not going to see them as often. But you know, if you create a bunch of names like Littlefellow and, and Blackbeard and White Hills, the problem you run into is that all of a sudden, either your novel sounds like you're, you know, you're, you're writing a pirate novel, or you know, you're, you're writing in Hobbiton in, in you know, Lord of the Rings, where everybody has one of these names, all the, the various Hobbit families. So obviously, you need a little bit more creativity than that. How do you do it? Well, the first thing you can do is create one of these names and then modify it. And this is done in a lot of very popular IPs. For those of you that are familiar with The Expanse, they have done a wonderful linguistic job of creating the Belter's language. And you can see what happened out there where you have this process called lenition, which is the softening of consonants. So in the world, if a word is originally Belter, eventually it becomes Belta. It'll change over time. These continents will, will soften. You know, a T will become a TH often. And a hard R sound will become more of an H sound. And I'm not going to go over all of these, these rules that are part of lenition, but just suffice it to know that words are going to change over time. And so what you can do, I would highly recommend using Wikipedia. Look up lenition. It's got all the rules for how it works. And then start applying that to certain words in your universe. So if you create a name using the four categories 
that we, we came up with before, you can then change it slightly using these rules. So you can modify it so it's no longer as recognizable. It's not White Hills, maybe it's White Hills, because in that particular area, they, they speak with that kind of accent where they've got that hard V sound. And you get to decide kind of what fits in, in your particular setting. So you also have the option of anglicizing or, you know, Welshifying or, you know, Japaneseifying a name. Is that a word? It is now. Where, you know, commonly what would happen if you were an immigrant to our country and you understood that you wanted to blend in as much as possible, you would jettison your European name. You know, Petros is Greek and, and became Peter. Albrecht would become Albright. You know, Kuko, which is uh, Italian, became Cook. Janssen's became Johnson. And, and in each of those cases, you, you can see that they're modifying it to fit in with the culture that they're coming to. So if you know that your, your, your cultural name is based on, let's say, Japanese, you could make it using the system above, take it to a translation service on Google and have it translated into Japanese, and all of a sudden you have a foreign version of those same words and it's going to sound a lot more like a real name because you're basically just doing a foreign version of what you see above. And then lastly, how about first names? Like, how do you do first names First names ultimately were created the same way that last names were. They were just done in smaller groupings. So you would have 150 to 250 people maybe in a tribe, and those people would all get names based on the hopes or the perceived attributes that they wanted that child to have. So if you were born with blue eyes, they might have named you something blue, like the ocean or the sky or whatever the native term of that was. And so if you're naming a character now, there's a really good likelihood that they're going to have a name in that universe that was created before. So maybe an ancestor had it or it's a common name. But really kind of our job is to come up with the original version of that name. And that's where you're looking at those perceived hopes and attributes for, for a given kid that parents were choosing that were going to be chosen from the natural world around them. And then these are oftentimes shortened, especially if they come from a lower socioeconomic level. So the, the richer they are and the more educated they are, the larger their first names are likely to be. You're going to get something like an Alexander, whereas at a lower socioeconomic scale, you might get an Alex. You're going to get somebody whose name naturally is shorter. And you'll see this. I mean, if you read anything from, you know, The Wheel of Time to Lord of the Rings to just about any series, you'll, you'll notice that those that do a great job of names, they're, they're setting names in small towns to be shorter because those towns had shorter names, because the simpler a tribal setup, the more simple the names tend to be. So you want to use that accordingly. If you are writing about a prince, chances are he has a two or a three syllable name and then maybe a shorter nickname that you use for him. But if your character is a street urchin, then they may not have a four character name like Aaron or, you know, Nara or something very short. So yeah, there, those are some guidelines to creating names. If you guys have additional questions, and I know there always are some, or you have a name that you want us to take a look at, feel free to post that in the comments of this video. We can review those names, answer additional questions about how to create names. And again, if you have still more questions, there is the first video in the series, which does introduce some other concerns to be aware of when choosing names. It's a wide, deep topic that, you know, I can't in a one 15 minute video get everything across, but hopefully I got enough to make this useful. So either way, guys, if you don't mind tossing this uh, in a vote, uh, a like, we would appreciate it. I need to get back to the writing. I will see you guys next week.